We're now going to turn our attention to Java method references. And I'll explain what a method reference is. I'll also talk about a related concept called a constructor reference, which is just a method reference for constructors. And again, we'll look at a whole pile of examples to try to make everything as crystal clear and concrete as we can. So what is a method reference? A method reference is a very compact, easy to read handle, explain that in a second, for a method that already has a name. So remember, Lambda expressions were kind of unnamed. They didn't have a name. They just had computation with a little syntactic sugar to pass parameters or not. Whereas method references are explicitly referring to methods by name. And you can read the link at the bottom of the page for a nice tutorial from the Java website that talks about method references. Uh, for some reason, they put it under the OO heading. It's not really that OO, it's more FP, but uh, that's just their naming convention, I suppose, at uh, Oracle. So basically, it's, it's shorthand syntax for a Lambda expression that executes one named method. And method references are super duper cool and very concise. So let's take a look at a couple of different forms of method references. There are basically four different types of method reference forms. One is a reference to a static method. So if you had a class like string, for example, and you wanted to reference a static method, you could have a method reference that would be string colon colon name of static method. So an example would be string colon colon value of, which will uh, return the value of a string. Now the corresponding lambda expression would be s, where s is a string, arrow, string dot value of s. But given a choice, we would typically prefer to use the method reference version because it's much more concise. There's less syntax going on there. So that's one model. Another model is to have a reference to an instance method of a particular object. So in that case, we have some, some variable s, a type string in this example. And so you say the containing object s colon colon instance method name. Now remember that there's two different types of methods, or actually more than two, but two common types of methods in Java are static methods that don't need to be called with a, an object and instance methods that do need to be called with an object, namely an instance. And so as you can see here, we have uh, s colon colon to string. So that says that's a method reference to the to string method on object s, which needs to be a string. And then you can take a look and see the corresponding lambda expression would be s arrow s dot to string, which is just, again, a bit more verbose. Yet another way to refer to a method reference is to refer to an instance method of an arbitrary object of a given type. So now we're not saying object s. We're simply saying whatever object we happen to be dealing with in this context, and the context is something that's always known by the compiler on the runtime system when you use this in practice. We say class name, like string, colon, colon, instance method name. So say string, colon, colon, to string. It's not a static. It's requiring an object, but we don't care what the object is. And again, if you have some object s, s arrow, s dot to string, um, that's a little bit more specific than what the method reference allows you to do. It lets you be more, more generic. And then the fourth and final type of method reference is called a constructor reference, which is a reference to a constructor. And that's very quite, really quite simple. You have the name of the class, colon, colon, new. Because of course, if you recall, if you want to make a new instance of a class, you would say new class. So you could say, you know, new string. Well, the way you turn that into a constructor reference is you say string, colon, colon, new. And we'll talk more about this when we get into functional interfaces because there's some subtleties related to how this works. But the easy one to remember is the constructor that takes no parameters, so the default constructor. So string colon colon new will simply make you a, a string that's an empty string uh, in this particular case. And the lambda expression variant of that would be open, close, arrow, new string. So those are the different ways of creating uh, references that are method references or expressing method references and comparing and contrasting them with the corresponding lambda expressions. Now that we've talked about method references and you know a little bit about them, let's talk about some of the benefits you get by using them. 
So the main benefit of a method reference and, and really why it's such a valuable feature in Java is it's even more compact than a Lambda expression. So it's a form of parameterization, behavior parameterization, that's even more concise. And if you take a look here, the, the main difference is they're not quite as flexible because you're really limited to the named method. and You can't do fancier computations with them, but they're really concise. So there's situations where they pay off. Let's take a look at an example where I think you'll agree that it's, it's the best of all the alternatives we've looked at so far. So here we go back to our example from before, which is the, the EX1 example in my Java 8 GitHub repository. And you can see here that we're going to use a method reference to pass to the sort method from the arrays class. So arrays.sort name array, comma, string colon colon, compare to ignore case. And I think you'll agree with me that that's really concise, even more concise than the lambda expression that appears right above it. So I, I kind of show this as like a, a little tiny car, maybe like you'd have in a circus or something like that, that can seat one person and no luggage, no suitcase, no briefcase, no laptop, you're just crammed in there. But my goodness, is it concise. Method references also help us to promote code reuse. So if you've got a method like compare to ignore case, we can trivially reuse it by just passing it in as a method reference to a method, like in this case, sort, that expects to have something that you can use to do the comparison. So in this particular case, why are we getting reuse? We're getting reuse because Arrays.sort never changes, but we can parameterize it with different forms of methods to get different behaviors. So for example, here we see we're going to be comparing to ignore case. Conversely, here we're going to use the compare to method on string, which includes case. So ignore case includes case. In both cases, arrays.sort is identical. And for those of you who recall the discussions of patterns, if you took CS uh, 3251 at Vanderbilt or something equivalent elsewhere, this is basically the strategy pattern. So we're able to strategize the behavior of the sort method through behavior parameterization in an incredibly concise way. And I should also point out that as with converting from anonymous inner classes to Lambda expressions, so too will the modern IDEs allow you to be able to convert from Lambda expressions to method references and vice versa. If, if you're as crazy enough to want to go backwards and go from a method reference to a Lambda expression and then from a Lambda expression to an anonymous inner class, you know, the only reason you ever do this if you had to write code that would be portable to older versions of Java that didn't support these modern features. That's about the only reason you ever go backwards, but you can go both directions and your, your IDE should be able to allow that to occur automatically. So it's a very, very good practice to get into to use method references whenever you possibly can. And as I said before, your IDE will often assist you in making those transformations. So let's now go ahead and talk about how to apply method references in practice. So this is a little bit uh, refined as to what we were showing before. And this will also give us a chance to discuss some other interesting features of Java that we'll talk about in more detail as we get further along in this part of the course. So as before, we have an array of names that are represented as strings. And now we're going to go ahead and print the, the contents of the name array. And there's a bunch of different ways to do this. So one way to do it is to use println. So what we're going to do here is we're going to print out the names in the array. Well, how do we make this work? Well, we can use a factory method that I believe started to be part of Java in Java 10. And there's a factory method called of, very uh, short pithy name, you could say list.of and list.of will convert an array of type T, in this case an array of strings, into a list of T or a list of strings in this case. So it returns a fixed size list that's backed by an array. So that would be one way we could go ahead and print out the contents by converting that. We could also use Java's for each methods and there's a couple different variants of this and you're going to get a chance to implement the for each method in the next version of your unsynchronized array class that for assignment 1b. And basically here's a couple different ways to do this. One way to do it is to take the name array and convert it into something called a stream. We'll talk more about streams later. Streams are a really cool 
modern Java feature that allows you to be able to have a stream or a flow of values or data. So in this case, we're going to use the of factor method of stream in order to be able to convert the name array into a stream of the contents of the name array. And then we're going to use the for each method together with a method reference. So you say for each, and then you pass in system.out colon colon print, and that will go ahead and print each of the elements in the stream to the output. And I used print here instead of println just because I didn't want it all to run off the bottom of the slide. But if you do print, as you can see the way I've shown it, it kind of gloms all the, all the elements together. But that's an example of applying a method reference in conjunction with the for each method on a stream. Now it also turns out that there's a for each method that's available on other types of collections, like a list, for example. So here we can use the list.of factor method again to convert the name array into a list. And then we can use the for each method that's actually part of list. And it becomes part of list because it's part of collection. And collection gets it because it's basically implementing the iterable interface and so on and so forth. You don't have to worry too much about the implementation details here. But the long and the short of it is that collections have a way of being able to call the for each method for every element in the collection. And in this case, once again, we're going to pass in system.out.print as a method reference, which will end up performing the designated action, in this case printing, on each element in the list. Now, an interesting question arises in some people's minds, and we'll talk about this more later. What's the difference between for each on a stream versus for each on a collection? Because at some level, they look very similar. But it turns out they're actually just a little bit different. So on a stream, for each doesn't designate the order. And the reason for that has to do with parallel streams, which we'll, which we'll talk about later. So for each on a parallel stream can produce the elements in whatever order it feels like based on whatever's most efficient, given the underlying way in which threads are scheduled on cores and so on. Whereas in a collection, for each is defined to be essentially from left to right or beginning to end or from the beginning iterator to the end iterator. Uh, so essentially, for each on a collection is more well-defined, the ordering is better defined or is defined, whereas for each on a stream, it's not defined. For intents and purposes of the moment, don't worry too much about that. That's just a note to tuck away, deepen your subconscious in case this issue ever arises in practice. So that's the end of our overview of Java method references. At this point, you should be pretty well equipped to be able to do assignment 1B, which will come out after assignment 1A is finished, uh, or about the time you submit your, your first initial submission of assignment 1A. And this will give you a chance to play around with some of the features we just talked about. And then I also assure you that later parts of the course, when we talk about streams, when we talk about completable futures, when we talk about reactive streams, we'll also be using Lambda expressions and method references galore as the way of parameterizing the behaviors in the streams, reactive streams, and completable futures. So the investment you make now in learning these concepts and features in functional Java will pay off down the road.